Oh, it's so very nice to see you once again on Collider Mailbag. This is our casual kind of laid back show where you guys have just submitted a whole bunch of emails to collidervideo at gmail.com. And we've gone through them, picked out some really cool ones, and we're going to discuss it. And to do that, it is the modest assassin himself, Dennis Zhang. What's up? What's up? Today is definitely going to be a laid back it collider feels like mailbag. It. it definitely feels like it. We're, we're very chill and relaxed and helping us mm -hmm. to chill and relax is Natasha Martinez. Hello, Natasha. Yes. Happy to be here on this lazy Saturday morning. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thanks. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Let's get into this. What have you guys been writing? What are you asking? Natasha, what's up first? Gary Richardson writes, Hey, Collider, can you answer me this question, please? Why didn't DC just start off as Marvel did with standalone movies for their tentpole characters? The argument has been made they are desperate to catch up with Marvel, but why? Other than Man of Steel for Soups, no other DC hero has received one-off attention yet. People would still go to watch Justice League whether it came out in a year or five years from now. Possibly more would if they had seen the characters introduced previously on their own. So why not just take your time and let the origin slash standalone movies for Batman with Affleck, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Cyborg, or maybe even a new Green Lantern come first? It worked well for Marvel, and I can't understand why it wouldn't have worked for DC. Can you enlighten me, please? Um, I think that it, 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 you have to realize it is because of the Marvel competition. And, and <laughs> you know, even though when this thing was first announced, I tend to agree when I for let's let's develop the characters first and then let's get into the Justice League and the Batman v Superman but the problem is that they they don't have the structure I think the way that Marvel Marvel did it they really did it well with the first Iron Man movie because what John Favreau was able to set that up that that's when it kind of combined into the rest of the universe. And they got, they had to really, it took a while to finally develop and they were leading up to the Avengers. That was always the goal. But I think that what they wanted to do it was an interesting way to do it. And I still say it with Batman v Superman. I think that Batman v Superman set up the possibility of their DCU very well in this movie. You can say whatever you want with other criticisms that you had about Batman v Superman. For me, I really enjoyed the way that they set up the other characters and the potential of these other movies. And I think that a lot of people left, whether you liked it or didn't like it, saying that Wonder Woman uh, by Gal Gadot was handled very well and that it, it, it looked very interesting the way that they set up those kind of old school pictures and, and everything that they're going to do with her even the, the stuff with Aquaman and whatever it was that they were setting up throughout that movie, um, I thought that they, that they took the structure of saying, okay, let's get, we got Man of Steel, we have, we've set up Superman now, who is our, one of our most iconic character. We need to introduce Batman, so it's a new Batman, so let's put that new Batman in a movie with a guy who is established. I thought that that was a smart move as well, too. But as they're developing all this stuff, it's doing it in, into two movies. It's bringing all these eyes and ears into... A movie that, again, even though it, the fans really do seem to really enjoy the movie as well, too. And I think it was, was so funny, real quick, is that I was the guy, I think, that was looking forward to this movie the least out of everybody. And mm -hmm. I think I enjoyed it. The, well, it can't be. It can't be. It can't be. But, I, but I, I definitely ha have been on more of the, I liked it for what it was, even though I knew mm -hmm. it had flaws. But I just think that because so many eyes and, e are, and ears are on this movie. That it's a good way to set it up because it's Batman. When you get it, introduce us there. Because what happens if they introduce cyber, a cyborg movie, a standalone movie, and no one sees it? And then you know, then it's like, oh, well, that wasn't set up very well. And and they and the Batman movie. Remember, we didn't all accept Batman Ben Affleck right away. I'm be, I'm one of those people too. It took a little bit to do it. And why not do it when you when you introduce him for Batman v Superman? So I actually think that the way that they're marketing this particular thing by doing it differently than Marvel works. How do you feel? Well, I remember when they first announced, Bat announced Batman v Superman. I said. I actually would have preferred a solo Batman movie first before going into that, and maybe not even doing a Batman v Superman movie and having just go to Justice League, because mm -hmm. the whole appeal <coughs> is to see Batman and Superman on screen together for the first time. So we already saw that now. They already had Batman v Superman. Right. I thought maybe they would have saved that for Justice League. I, I do agree they shouldn't put like something like a cyborg solo film first. I think having him in Justice League, and then that way people can get to know him and like him he's a lesser known character but i went and minded a uh, flash or wonder woman or green lantern before a justice league uh I, th I think people have to understand and this is, goes against what i'm saying is <coughs> studios are always looking for trends they're mm -hmm. always looking to catch up they're always looking to copycat and so 
people have to remember these movies take time two three four years in development and shooting post-production so sometimes a lot of times they're just trying to guess okay is this superhero thing gonna die is it still gonna be around let's get there that's right. why they've announced this whole slate we don't know we don't know in 2020 2021 2025 uh, is superhero movies still going to be around? I mean, they are, but in what capacity? Are they going to be as popular as they still are now? I don't know. I really hope, though, that they... I don't know if Jeff Johns is the guy, then Jeff Johns is the guy. But, like, they need a guy um, similar to what Kevin Feige is doing, though, too, because of this. It's just... It, it does feel sometimes that DC is It's just kind of like... In the beginning, I think it's a little more on target now, but it's like they're just kind of throwing mm-hmm. things up there and hoping that it hits. Um, but with Batman v Superman... I do think that it was set up very well, and I'm and I think that they are on a good path here because they have now. This is these are going to be the first two movies with Wonder Woman, with Suicide Squad, and then Wonder Woman that are not helmed by Zack Snyder. So I think that it's now we're now we're in, now in a similar spot to where what, what Marvel does with all their different directors that they they do. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. Let's 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 see what happens. But I I'm okay with the way that they've been handling their universe. Yeah, I think uh, has any Marvel film go like with Zack Snyder? He's done Man of Steel. Mm-hmm. He he already did Batman v Superman, and he's doing Justice League right now. Is there anyone at Marvel? Any director at Marvel? Russo that Brothers. done three? Oh yeah. Russo Brothers are gonna do okay. yeah Winter Soldier, Civil War, and then Infinity War one and two. Yeah, because at that point before them, I don't think there was anyone. Because even Joss Whedon, he only did two. And Favreau that was it. did two. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th- yeah. James Gunn will do two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that it seems to be right now. But we we also don't know. I mean, it, look, it looks. I I said I, I don't think they're gonna take Zack Snyder off. I don't think. After the after the box office numbers, even though they weren't like stupendous, they were still good. Yeah, it's already made five hundred million. Yeah, exactly. You don't pull. It's it's like with Michael Bay. As much as we bitch and complain about the Transformers movies, Paramount's doing the right thing. Yeah. You get the guy who made them all the money. I yeah. personally don't like it. I want to see something new out of that franchise because I loved that franchise right. as a child. Yeah, but for them, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay, what's next? Bobby Hoskins writes, Hey, Collider crew, do you think The Rock is actually a good actor? No doubt he's a movie star, but after seeing San Andreas, I'm really questioning his acting ability. Now, San Andreas may not be the litmus test for judging a good acting performance, but there are scenes that he really could have turned it on. He's talking about his dead daughter and doesn't shed a single tear. He only smiles when he finds the daughter that he's traveled so far in a disaster to get to. He just laughs after that same daughter is revived from drowning maybe it's because of bad directing but he could have done a lot more as an actor what are your thoughts i'm going to pretty much say what you did at the end i think that was about the directing and i think that that was because i've seen san andreas twice it's a fun (coughs) it's a fun dopey movie and i thought he served the role as the action star and that's really all he was asked to do in that movie you want to see him do really good acting, check out Snitch. And I hear Faster is good in as well, too. But Snitch is a movie that he's very different than his... And you can tell that he was going for the acting. I think that The Rock has gotten significantly better as an actor. Now, is he a tremendous actor? Are we going to see him winning an Oscar? Probably not. But I think that he's one of those guys... He is very similar to what Channing Tatum has done. Very, very hard worker. Not just in it to say... Oh, yeah, I'm going to shoot. Yeah, give me my money. I'm out of here. The dude is dedicated. We saw it in his football career. We saw it in his wrestling career. And we're seeing it now in his acting career. He works more than anyone we know. And then, like you said, he's absolutely a movie star. This we know. Um, I don't think you can really judge it off of San Andreas, as you mentioned in your email. But I think that that movie called for the popcorn action star. It doesn't really look for the in-depth stuff. And I think that as far as the, the daughter scene goes and, and all the other finding his daughter, that's the director should be saying, okay, all right, Dwayne, may, let's, let's go down this path here. Try to do this. But I, I'm telling you, go check out, check out Snitch. The movie's fine, but he's really good in the movie. What do you think? Yeah, I don't think he, I would call him a good actor yet. I would say he's a solid actor. Yeah. And, and I did see Snitch, and he was pretty good in that. And that was not an action movie. They kind of sold it as an action movie in the trailer. Right. But his character actually wasn't the one like trying to fight and beat up people. And I thought he did a decent job with San Andreas. Yeah, you can't really judge off of that plus you know not every scene requires you to cry in it just by right. crying doesn't mean you're a good actor <laughs> it's 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 more about it, are you believable in the emotions that you're trying to convey and i think he has gotten a lot better he's got tons of charisma you know what he's really good at he's a lot of comedic timing yeah he does. yeah so 
that stuff I think all bodes well for him, and I think he is someone that's going to work <coughs> hard at his acting and try and get improve and get better because he's already done so. That's a great point, though. With comedic, I think that comedic acting doesn't get enough credit as yeah. far as in the resume of being a good actor. It's that is part of acting. It's because it doesn't get recognized by the Academy a lot because it's not Daniel Day Lewis. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like being able. You look at that comedy timing that he's got. He's got great comedic timing. You look at what he does, even in these trailers now with Kevin Hart. It looks like he's stealing the movie. Baywatch certainly saw something from him. If you've ever seen him on Saturday Night Live, he know he's got it. He just has the rhythm. It's just you either you're born with it or you don't have it. And he's got it. So I think that that would add into the fact, is he a good actor? Yes, he is, because he's a good comedic actor. He's got a great point. And is he great? Not yet, because that's the whole package. Yeah. That's everything. And I want to see whether or not he's able to do that in more. I want to see him do more roles like Faster and, and, and Snitch and stuff like that, because to see where he can go and, and what you know, where he can kind of get down. You know, the other thing, by the way, the other movie that he was good in comedy was... Um, what was it? Get Sh not Get Shorty. Uh, what was the the? It was the sequel to Get Shorty. Oh yeah, I know which one you're talking. Yeah, it was about. a sequel. Whatever the sequel I was, forgot. Get Shorty. He was in that. Ha one have you watched uh, Ballers yet on HBO? I've seen. I've seen Ballers. He's good yeah. in that. Yeah, he is good in that. And that's some dram it's dramatic a drama. Drama slash comedy, but there yeah. is like a little you know dramatic elements in terms it's like of like the new entourage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. For sports. Yeah. Um, all right. What's next? Ajal Syed Ali writes, Hey, guys, I'm really loving the show and enjoying the marriage between the Schmoes and Collider crew. I wanted to ask you guys about the role of an editor on a film. Like some of you guys mentioned during your review of Batman v Superman, the film had a number of odd and confusing edits. Does this fall at the feet of the editor or is it the director's fault because it's their vision? Thanks and keep up all the great work. I think it's a... It's a mixture of both, but it's it's I it's depending on the director I think too, because you know if if it's a director that you know, is maybe not as high because Snyder's pretty high profile, uh, so if it's a, someone who's maybe lower profile and then there's a particular edit that maybe he doesn't like that the studio likes they'll keep that edit. Um, but if there's an if there's an edit and then the direct like someone like Snyder says no I want it to go here and here and it does go to his vision I think that I correct me if I'm wrong but I think it falls back a lot of the big studio films that is for sure on the on the director well yeah I mean in this case it, I feel bad for the editors <laughs> for Batman v right, Superman because right. they're taking a shellacking and actually and even in Zack Snyder's case even though he is a big profile director I have a feeling that even he didn't want to do this, where they had a three-hour cut of this film, and it got taken down to two and a half by the studio and all that pressure. And and the thing about the ed editing position is it's an underappreciated, probably one of the most underappreciated positions in the industry because most people don't notice editing, and right. you're not supposed to be noticed when you when when something's being edited well. So I have a feeling that like those guys are probably I don't know if it was uh, one guy or two, but. Uh, or, or gal, um, I, I have a feeling they're getting so much crap right now about it, and it's not really their fault because they probably had somewhat of a more cohesive story, right. and they're like, you know what? Let's take out half an hour. Half an hour off of three hours is that's a good percentage of your movie, and you're, you know, a lot of things that maybe would make more sense in the three hour cut is is taken away, and the editors start getting blamed for that. Yes, I agree with that when it comes to. And when there's a movie, well, first of all, there's, there's a script that's the studio should also know. There's a script that is you know, two, 242 pages, whatever it is, too. And the director says, I want to shoot 242 pages. You should be either say, no, let's yeah. let's make it let's let's make it uh, not 242, but, you know, you know, yeah. 140. Um, but let's uh, <coughs> let's either cut this down or shoot it. And let's because I think that does take away from the overall tone of it. But then there wasn't just because you can certainly see there are certain I, I'm very curious to see that three hour cut mm -hmm. and see how it plays but then there's also things that I don't, I don't want to do a spo total spoiler here um, but there's some there's a scene at the end that it's just a matter of when you're holding on a particular shot and I want to get the emotion mm -hmm. And then it just cuts to something else, and I'm sucked out of that emotion I was starting to get invested in, and then I have to get invested in this other scene, and right as I'm about to get invested in that scene, I cut back to that place I was just at. It's jarring. And that, I think, was a directing choice more than it was the editor's mm -hmm. choice. But that, that's, that's also, it just depends on the It's on the tough, movie. and also, you know, editor can only do so much. They get what they get from the director right. and what, the, what, what is shot, and so if they have a ton of great material to work with, then they can put something together, or maybe... You know, a lot of times, like with uh, actors, like they're always 
for their performances, it's it's actually obviously the director and the second most person is 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 the editor because right. they they rely on them to get the best performance because you right. can make a good actor look terrible if you pick out their worst worst performances and put them together hold a second or two longer yep. and they look like an idiot right. but you cut right. a second or two before and they look great right all right, what's next? Mark Overby writes, Hello, crew. In a past episode, you talked about Disney taking its ball and going home in the form of having its movie trailers open at its own convention a week before Comic-Con. There was also a mention of the idea that Marvel should hold its own convention as well. Seeing that Comic-Con has turned into a near-impossible beast to get into, do you see a future where studios follow Disney's lead and break away from Comic-Con to form their own conventions? Uh, not all the studios have the luxury of being able to do what Disney has because Disney has Marvel, Disney has Star Wars, Disney has Pixar, Disney has their Disney movies that they've turned to feature films. So the answer to that question is no. And, um, they, these other studios don't really have. I mean, you could you could maybe argue a case for Warner Brothers if they want once they develop their their DC properties a little bit more to um, to have their own con, but I don't I don't think that's going to happen. I think Warner Brothers is going to stay at Comic Con, and maybe they're maybe they're kind of licking their chops the fact that that Disney's not going to be there, and then they, they could promote their stuff more. So I think Warner Brothers is going to be more of a presence at at Comic Con for sure. I think that what's going to happen in Comic Con, as far as Hall H goes, eventually if Disney does pull back, is it's going to start to become a very TV. Heavy mm -hmm. thing because they're already with Game of Thrones and um, Walking, Dead. Walking Dead, and now Daredevil. I'm sure is going to do something this year. Maybe, maybe not. Um, well, probably not because it's locked. But whatever. There, there's there's the Preacher. There's there's things that all these shows now because of the way that streaming is so different. I think that eventually Comic Con will start to push in a, in a television way if indeed the Disney start pulling out. But uh, I don't see other studios making this jump because I just don't think they have enough to run other cons. Yeah, we talked a lot about this this past week on a movie talk. I wasn't and on, on Jedi too. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't on the on the show, but yeah, it's one of those things where I understand why Disney wants to do it, and they definitely looks like if they're moving things closer to to Comic Con and all that stuff and pulling out. Like last year, we didn't have Marvel at Comic Con. Right. Um, I personally, it, it's weird for us. It's great, right? It's like, okay, we get to go to Comic-Con. We get to go to WonderCon. We get to go to, you know, MarvelCon if they have one. Yeah. Star Wars Celebration. All these things. WonderCon. But yeah. I always come back to the average fan. The average fan cannot afford yeah. to go to all these different conventions. They may get to choose one. Maybe not even once a year. Maybe once every two years or three years. They get to pick one. And so I like the idea of having Comic-Con have everything there for them. Movies, TV, comic books, video games, um, you know, Marvel, DC, uh, any, everything. But now if you start separating everything off, right? Let's say Marvel's not at Comic-Con and Star Wars isn't at Comic-Con and maybe there's DC there. It's like, what, if you... I'm not the type of person, and I know some people are there, I only love DC. I only love Marvel. I only love this. It's like, I love all of it. I love that voice. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, and so... I want to go one place and get it as much as I can. Yeah. You know, I don't want a separation. I, what if, like, we went to Comic Con, like, you know what? There's no more television here anymore. We only cover movies. You know, and like, it's like, okay, but I, I love television. I love movies. I want to, right. I want everything. So, yeah, no, I understand it. And this is, look, look Peter Serretta from Slash Film was on Jedi Council this past Thursday, and he made a great point. <laughs> it's, and, and you, you make this point in your email as well. It is very hard to get into Comic Con. Yeah. It is very hard. Like there were Peter told a story about how these guys were online buying tickets for Comic Con the next year. It's it's one of the things that, that as a fan for me, if I wasn't able to get in every year because of like press stuff and for my job, I would be furious. It's like I would be writing letters to uh, because there's so many things with San Diego. They've been asked. Build out your convention center. You know that each and every year you're getting more and more people. Build out the convention center. More money into it means more money for the for the city as well too. Yeah, it's easier said than done. I get that, but this kind of stuff is going to happen because Peter's point, which I agreed actually after thinking about it, was that Disney is kind of given an alternative now. Okay, you can't get into Comic Con. Come to our thing. Yeah. We're going to have we'll have all the stuff that you because no one says they have to have Star Wars and Marvel there because they now if they want to can can have their own con a week before it's like 
Come watch our stuff. If you're a Star Wars fan, you're a Marvel fan, you're going to get all the Marvel stuff that you want. You're going to get a lot of Star Wars stuff as well, too. You'll get some Disney stuff. You'll get some Pixar stuff. Come to our thing if you can't get into Comic-Con or if you want to choose between the, between the two of us. It depends on what you like. If you want to go with the other stuff at Comic-Con, by all means, go. I think that it's it's a different option because I really think San Diego needs to build out that convention center. They finally are started to... like I've been railing on them for yeah. years. Last year was the first time I actually saw movement on it. I actually saw. Oh, they're things. starting to build out. I actually saw like hotels being built. Mm. There's like that this one uh, kind of uh, I don't know if it's going to be a, a kind of like a arena or something like that yeah. or something right next to one of the hotels. Okay. So I finally saw some movement, but this is the first time in like years since they said they've been doing it. This is going to make them do that. This will help do that yeah. because. This kind of thing's going to happen out more because it's absolutely part of it. Look, there's other parts of it where Disney's like, we have enough of the properties. We're going to do our yeah. own thing. And they're flexing their muscles a little bit, and that's, that's their prerogative. But I think that it's also because of everything we are just talking about. There is not enough room for everybody that wants to go, and it's hard for people to go. Well, I mean, speaking selfishly for myself and probably the rest of the crew here, having, Mar uh, having Disney move like Celebration or D23 closer to uh, Comic-Con sucks for us. Yeah. Because, you know, as, as much fun as we have at those conventions, it's a lot of work. it wipes us out. We're, like, dead tired. There is a scenario that I'm going to be at Star Wars Celebration <laughs> in London on the week before Comic -Con. San Diego and getting back the day before. I'm jet lagged from Florida. <laughs> I am going to be. In, I mean, look, boo hoo to me that I, this is this was my job. I get it. I'm just telling you it, this. This is this as far as where it lands. It, it's it's a bit of a strain, but so I don't know. I mean, I think and John Campy was mentioned on on Jedi as well too, and I and I I started to agree with him that I think that Disney might have could have done a move to where they kept D23 at September or October. Mm -hmm like they normally did, still yeah. doing what they did instead of doing it a week before. But I think that it's also to show Comic-Con you're not going to be the only game in town right now. Like, imagine if you had to go to Star Wars Celebration, and right after that, go to Comic-Con, and then right after that, go to D23. Right. That <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I know. Uh, don't, don't put that in the atmosphere. All right, what's next? Felix Gomez writes, Hello, Collider crew. We all know about the divided response to Batman v Superman, which is mostly being blamed on the script written by Chris Terrio based on a first draft by David S. Goyer. Is it really Terrio's fault the script resulted the way it did? Do you think that the fact that Chris Terrio will be writing Justice League on his own without Goyer's input will make for a better script? I desperately want Justice League to be good and not the convoluted mess that BV Yes, turned out to be. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Oh man, it's so torn. Every every time like, when you hear just these topics, it's like it's this is the thing. And I and I already listen. I'm reading the comments already that there's just I I understand how passionate Batman and Superman fans are. It's just like why is everyone bashing on us? It's just become a bash show. It's not. We're objectively talking about this thing. Like, like I told you, I enjoyed the movie, but did the did the script to me have problems? It did. Um, this particular fan thought it was a mess. Like, so there's there's things that, that you know, was it Terry's fault? Um, I don't know. There's people that would say that it is. Mm -hmm. There's other people that go back to the Snyder thing. Who knows what it is? You can also go back to what we were just saying before. Maybe the executives at Warner Brothers see the 500 million return within the first week and go. There's no problem with it. Yeah, they or, don't have a problem with it. We like the way it turned out. We like the, yeah, you say it's got sloppy editing. You saw it three times. You saw it four times. <laughs> yeah. so, you, you don't like Do it again. Yeah. Do Chris it again. Yo, you don't like Chris Terrio? Well, the script made, uh, the script was the re one of the reasons it made 500 million. So guess who's right in Justice League? So it makes sense. So I don't know if it was, if it was his fault to you, it, the, to, um, to Felix here, that it was a sloppy mess. But I'm sure someone right now who's got steam coming out of his ears thought it was a great <laughs> script and loved the way it came out. So to him, he probably probably thinks that Chris Terrio is a guy that should come back. So it's not that easy to say, oh, he should be out. Mm -hmm. Because even though you thought it was a mess, the box office returns show other. Um, that's not always that it means that it's a good script. Mm -hmm. It just means that that's what they're going to pay attention to. Yeah, well, it's, it's hard to tell because I didn't read the David Goyer first draft. Maybe if I had read it and then seen, like, did Terrio improve on it? Was there maybe certain things that they couldn't change or didn't want to change? You know, remember, you know, when they brought Ben Affleck on, then they had Chris Terrio come on. Yeah. It's like there was already a script, and I'm sure Zack Snyder had his, his ideas, so it may have been just a mishmash of stuff. So with Justice League, I'm still excited for it because... 
Uh, I think that with Chris Terrio, if it's just him writing the script, then maybe it's going to be more focused in one direction. Right. And then may- Zack Snyder probably will have learned kind of what at least some of the mistakes he made for from Batman v Superman. All right, what's next? Graf Fuller writes, Dear Collider, I love your shows. Been watching since the AMC days, all red. I watch a lot of TV, but it seems that what you watch and what I watch are so vastly different. The shows that get to me are Homeland, Orphan Black, Outlander, The Expanse, The Magicians, Quantico, and of course, Game of Thrones and Star Wars Rebels. I watch others too, but those are the ones that get to me. Could you talk about them from time to time? TV is in the platinum age and getting better. Thanks for the new TV talk. I cannot believe I'm saying this, but could you expand it to more days, though you are killing me on time here? I'm going to let Dennis say answer this <laughs> All one. All right. Well, we, we definitely want to expand. We want to do more than once a week. We want to do two times, maybe three times, maybe eventually get it daily. I think that's a goal of ours, but that's up to you guys. It's up to you guys watching the show getting a lot of views, sharing around, get, telling people about it. And the more views that it gets, the more we can tell the, you know, the big bosses above, hey, we want to do this daily, and they will give us money to do the resources to, to do that. And then on the other side, I feel like that will actually help with the, what you're talking about. We only have one weekly show, so we can, and there's so many television shows, so we can't cover them all. If we went daily, let's say we're doing that show five days a week, then we will be talking about a, a much a vi- wider right. range of shows because we need to <laughs> fill that time. Right. I totally agree. And I think that that's, that's one of the things when you and I were talking about just developing this show in general. It was like, what are we going to, if it's one week, you got to take the stuff that right now that seems to be the popular shows that people really want to talk about and, and kind of taking away from, uh, we were doing the, the, the recap shows. And we still have a few of the recap shows that are going on right now. But just to get that feel of the, the big shows that everyone wants to talk about and then exactly what Dennis said, once we expand this to two, three, possibly five days a week, it's all the stuff that's out there and, and, and that everyone's talking about TV world because there is a lot of TV news out there from, from casting to, to you know brand new shows that are coming out to expanding certain seasons. To again, just to say exactly what Dennis said, make sure that you guys continue to share, comment, like TV talk, let us know what you think about um, the crew, everything. Uh, that's how this show, the same way that movie talk evolved. It, it, we really need your guys' voices to do that. So thank you very much. All right, what's next? Reginald Lewis writes, I've been having these thoughts that I'm surprised I haven't seen anyone speak of yet. These past days, since seeing probably the most anticipated comic book movie in Batman v Superman, I have a two-part question that is cohesive in a sense. Do you think the success of comic book TV shows and Netflix series hinder movie expectations like Batman v Superman? Such as in a show, there's story progression and character development, unlike a movie where you digest it all in those few hours. Also, are us fanboys being too harsh on the movie because of high expectations on a movie that's never been done before on the big screen? It's bound to have its flaws. Shouldn't fans appreciate that we got to experience it? Would love to hear your discussion on these topics. Don't hold back. Reginald, this is a fantastic email from everything that you wrote in there I thought was was just handled so well. I think that there's so many questions, so many things that you asked that I, first of all, with the streaming, I do think that the streaming does to, you, you have to realize as you're watching so I was watching 11 63 the other day and as I was watching it I was thinking to myself this essentially is an eight hour film it was based off a book and they knew they wanted to go streaming and it, it is they don't hold back from it it's not a it's it, there's no censorship on it, it it's it's a streaming show that they can do it's similar to Netflix same thing with Daredevil Daredevil is what 10 episodes no like 12 or 13 12, 12 or 13 <laughs> 13 hour movie. It's yeah. really that's the way it's developed now because it, it's it's structured out as a 13 hour movie with exactly what Reginald was saying is that you can develop so much and no and there's so and you have a lot more time to do that but also you also have a couple I haven't finished Daredevil. What episode yet. are you on? It's 5. Um right. Oh, Dennis, you, you, Dennis just looked at me with this look of disgust. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, it's, it's tough, man. It's tough. Um, so uh, not the show. The show is awesome, but I, it's just been it's been a long week. But the, you know, um, the development of it and watching what they can do. You can take the pauses. You can take your breaks. You can go back to it. With a two hour, you have two hours, two and a half hours to tell your story in a movie, and that's it. Now, going into your other side of your question is, do we as fans give ourselves sometimes unrealistic expectations going in? I think the answer to that is 100% yes. I think that is absolutely. Um, I think that sometimes you go into, and I'm not going to discredit 
Schnapp's opinion at all because I think he makes great points of, of why he didn't like the film. Excuse me. <clears throat> but he was probably the most excited to see that movie out mm -hmm. of any of us. The guy was singing songs as we were walking <laughs> yes. to the theater. You're gonna, we're going to see Batman, Superman. You're gonna see, you saw it already, can't be. But it was this whole thing. He was, doing a, he, was, like, he was eight years old. Super excited. Now, do I think that part of that, and I think he'd even say, say as much, maybe, maybe he wouldn't, but I think that part of the reason why he was let down was because it didn't hit the expectations that in his mind and all the stuff from the comic books that he's read over the years of Batman and Superman, I think that to him, that's why he was let down. I think for me, initially, when I saw The Force Awakens, I was a little let down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, have soon, I've, I love it now. The more I watch it, I, I just uh, we watch it again. Our commentary is up uh, will be up on Tuesday, Tuesday, by the way, so make sure you check that out. But as I was watching it, I love it more and more. But going into that first time, I had all these ideas and expectations of what I wanted as a fan, and it didn't hit him. So I think that that why it just bummed me out a little bit. So I completely understand why that happens, and I think you're right. And I don't, I, but I think it's too easy to say, "Can't we just sit back and enjoy yes. it?" Because that doesn't mean, and and I don't think this in the case. Well, let's say let's take the Green Lantern. Let's say you're a big Green Lantern fan. And you go into that movie expecting something, and you got that. <laughs> you should be disappointed if you got the Daredevil with ben, with Ben Affleck, not the one, the unreleased one, the 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 other one, the theatrical cut. And you saw that, you should be disappointed. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on it. Dennis. Yeah, I mean, I agree, totally agree with you with uh, what what you were saying about the expectation. So I won't cover that, but I will talk about with the <coughs> streaming or the let's say twelve or thirteen yeah. hour episodes versus a movie. Yes, it. It is a little unfair in the sense that, yes, they have more time. However, that's not an excuse because you can do it because I know within Daredevil, I don't want to spoil anything, but it is something you've already seen before. But within one 10, 15, 20 minute se sequence in episode three between the Punisher and Daredevil right. on the rooftop, yep. you get it. Yeah. You get understand why they are fighting each other. You understand the motivations and the difference between the character, you get emotionally invested into them. And so, and that's, I'm, that's not the whole 13 hours or whatever. That's like a 10, 15 minute scene. You could do that in a movie. Well, 20 minutes, 20 minutes of that. They, they remember though, the structure from where that goes. I'm only like I said, five or six, wherever the hell I am, but they were able to say, we can spend 20 minutes in this 13 hour movie for this particular scene. If you condense that into a two and a half hour movie, you're limiting that scene now to about five minutes or yeah, six yeah. minutes. Yeah, but what I'm saying is within the context of of Daredevil and Punisher within mm -hmm. that series, you can still just do that. Imagine if it was just a movie. Right. And you take that scene and you put it in a movie. You think it should still be 20 minutes, though? You think they could still do that, that if it, in a two hour movie, yeah. tw spending 20 minutes on that rooftop? Ten, maybe 10 or 15. It's still work. Look, get the emotion in there. Get your, your the people invested. I agree that you can get invested yeah. and that you can get an emotional scene from the movie. Th that's it's what was missing from Batman v Superman. Sure. You know, look, look, there's a particular scene in the movie that people have been complaining about with, with a certain name that is mentioned, right? <laughs> right. Oh, uh, you should see the chat rooms when, when we're <coughs> on. I see it. I see uh, it. It goes all the time. Uh, but my, my thing with that, it wasn't that moment that that to me bothered me it was the fact that after that name was mentioned it wasn't like okay wait a minute you know what this was happening the whole entire movie and just because of that name now now i'm going to do something else what i would have liked is if they would have done well what's that name all right wait a minute now well, let's talk about it a second let's 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 figure out why exactly i'm not going to continue what i was yeah. doing and now like if there was like a three minute conversation instead of you know the 20 minute a three minute conversation to set up the emotion of why okay that makes sense. Let's do this. That makes sense to me. Um, but I just think that there was just sometimes that was pulled, that was scaled back. So I do think it can happen in movies. It certainly has happened in movies many yeah, we times. Movies. <laughs> sure, you get emotionally involved. There's way to emotionally involve characters throughout. I mean, but anyway, uh, I think that there's the streaming has definitely given people more options to get yeah. invested with the 13 hours. And, and on the business side of it, movies are. The studios want to make movies that are spectacles that bring people that are willing to pay for the movie ticket, drive, park, yeah. maybe if they have kids, have babysitters. There has to be a compelling reason for them to come, and spectacle it is. They can't sell that in a trailer. You right. know what I mean? Hey, get ready, you know? Uh, yeah. That's why a lot of these indie dramas are going straight to VOD, you know? Right. And that's why they're not getting released in theaters anymore, because that it fits that audience more. Yeah. All right, last one. 
Okay, William Shakespeare writes. Nice. Hey, Collider, been watching for years. There's been questions about directors and actors, but not so much about writers. I think that most movies' problems come from a bad script, and I see in many instances movies where I want to try to improve it. I want to make Hollywood movies with bigger budgets, but I don't live close by. I live in Europe. How do you think I should proceed? Should I just make a lot of scripts and then go there and try to sell it, or...? I'm gonna again. I'm gonna get this. Anytime we get questions like this, I want to throw it to Dennis because this is this. I I enjoy hearing Dennis talk about these these particular questions. So, what do you got for him, Dan? Uh, I mean, definitely should write a lot of scripts. Yep. Uh, I would send them out to you know script writing like contests and whatnot, and see if you can get some some sort of recognition. You know, win some awards, that type of stuff, and then try and parlay that into getting an agent because the agent is the guy who's going to be able to take your script, shop it around, get it in the right hands. Because you worked in development as yep. well, and I, I worked a little bit in development. There's so many scripts, and people won't believe this. Producers don't read the scripts. They they, they have coverage, which is basically they read or like... the assistants read them. Yeah, the yeah. assistants read them. They read... They basically, it's, a, it's like a game of telephone. They hear from their assistant who heard from some coverage person mm -hmm. that some script was good. Then maybe they'll read it. We we had a thing at so I worked at I worked for Silver Pictures for three years, and we had a thing that was weekend read was what it was, and we would take home like all these scripts that came in spec scripts, mm -hmm. and and so the way that it works the so you people know, like they had um, like literary literary agents would call up and go hey we've got a couple of original scripts that are up to we also have sample scripts from writers that are trying to get on one of your projects or maybe they're trying to get mostly it was people who were submitting their writers to be to bring on for for our projects that we had, or the it's, we have a brand new script that is up for to, to get purchased, you know. Mm -hmm. So during weekend read, we would get a bunch of scripts, and that was my. This is one of the reasons I quit my job is because like the whole, I would never see movies. I'd be reading scripts all the time the whole weekend. I've taken about fifteen scripts, and I have to read fifteen scripts over the weekend. And if I liked them, I would tell my, my bosses. I'd be like, okay, this one was good. This one was good, and and then. Like you said, we'd submit them for coverage. Do so. What I would always the one thing that I always um, suggest people doing: don't ever submit your script to a production company with without an agent or anything, too, because they're never going to read it. The agents are the ones that, that sell it, and plus the fact they legally can't. So what you should do is exactly what Dennis said: is write a spec script, which means that let's say that you if you have a particular um, television show that you like, whether it's Daredevil or whatever it is, write an episode of it. Write an episode of it, and and that'll be your, your spec script that you can submit to a literary agent. And if the agent uh, likes your work, he'll meet with you, and then he can start to push your push your work. For example, at the time I was working at Warner Brothers, uh, Joss Whedon had written the Wonder Woman script. Um, it had been developed for a long time at Warner Brothers, and then they just the, the two couldn't really see head to head on it, and Joss left the project, and they really didn't know what they were going to do with Wonder Woman. My buddies uh, Matt Jennison and Brent Strickland had I was I had interned with them at Village Roadshow years ago, and they were writers, and they didn't have any representation; they had nothing. So they wrote a, a Wonder Woman spec script, and they and my buddy Matt called me and said, "Hey, listen." can you read this for me? And if you like it, can you get it to Susan, who was Susan Downey, Robert Downey Jr.'s wife, who was the president of Silver's company at the time? I said, sure. I'm like, whatever. You get that from your friends all the time. And I read it, and it was phenomenal. It took place like in the kind of a very Captain America type of script before mm -hmm. Captain America did it. Loved it. Got it to Susan. She had her assistant reader first. Her assistant yes. loved it. Then she read it. Then they gave it to the studio. The studio loved it. So I immediately got on the phone with my friend who was an, who was an agent, and I said, there's buzz on this thing. Talk to these guys. They signed them, and then they got a career out of it. So it's like it doesn't always happen that yeah. easy. <laughs> um, but but the thing is, it, it's there. There are ways to get your foot in the door if you want to be a writer. Yeah, and it's a filtering process. Yeah. Like you said, it goes through so many people. So yeah, you have to do that. Um, and, and I was gonna say too, like when you're talking about having to bring all the scripts home to read. Yeah. If you think it's it's boring to watch a boring movie. Oh reading God. a boring script is e ten times worse. Yep. Because it's like there's nothing. At least the movie keeps moving forward. Yep. You have to turn the page and read, like actually concentrate on it. It's, yeah, I totally. It's tough. It totally. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday edition of Mailbag. I would like to thank the crew that was joining me today. Of course, Dennis Zhang. Where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at thinkhero, Instagram Dennis.tnzeng, and I hope Natasha gets better. 
She's struggling. Look what she's doing yeah. just for you guys. <laughs> you guys can all find me hopefully feeling better on Instagram and Twitter at Natasha Lexis underscore. Yes, feel better, Natasha. And for me, you can find me at Christian Harlow on Twitter and Instagram. And if you didn't watch it, Mance <laughs> versus Roca, the most controversial match we've ever had. Um, <laughs> so there you go, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow on Mailbag. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.